Hallelujah. It's important that we confess every good thing that we have in Christ Jesus. That's very important. Each and every one of us, we, if we believe something, we got to say it. That's very important because saying is uh, the action part of your believing. One can believe in the heart and uh, stay wherever he is, but if you really want action to your faith or you want wheels to your faith, in other words, then you have to and you must confess what you believe. You must confess what you believe. Many people don't confess and they confess the wrong thing. Satan puts a lot of pressure into their hearts, into their lives, and they confess what Satan says through pressure. But through pleasure, they don't want to say what God says. Through pressure, we, we, we are forced to say certain things and we, we, we say it. And we kind of think, well, after all, it's a pressure. But the Bible says you do it in faith. Because, because in pleasure, you do it. God takes pleasure when you, when, you, when, you, when you confess good things out of your heart. Let me take you to that scripture. God is well pleased. Now we, usually we, we say things through pressure. But God wants you to understand that it takes me no pleasure in you speaking the wrong word. I want you to speak the right word in Christ Jesus. I want you to speak the right word and uh, because it pleases me. In Proverbs 23, Proverbs 23, and we'll read from verse 15 onwards. Proverbs 23 and verse 15 onwards. My son, if thine heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice, even mine. God says, I really rejoice if your heart is wise. Now, who is the wise man, according to the Bible? We've heard the story about the wise man who built his house, the foundation on the rock. And the foolish man built his house on the sand with no foundation. And when the rains descended and the strong winds came in, the house didn't stand. So God, take, God says, I take pleasure when your heart is wise because you're building a good foundation. You're not just a hearer only, but you are a doer of my word. God says, you are a doer of my word. God takes pleasure. He says, if your heart is wise, I rejoice. God says, my heart rejoices, even my own heart rejoices because you take pleasure. And God says, I will even rejoice. That word also means, I will even rejoice. My heart rejoices and I will even rejoice when you're a wise man. So, according to the scriptures, the wise person is not somebody who is, not that we despise somebody who is academically uh, strong enough to understand being intelligent in this world. But he can be so dumb in rejecting the gospel and rejecting the word of God, the very creator of the universe. So according to the Bible standard, a wise man is one who, one who hears the word and who practices the word. He says it and he practices it. That's a wise man. God says, I rejoice. My heart rejoices, even I will rejoice. Even I will rejoice. That's what it means there when he says, even I. Verse number 16, even my innermost being, verse 16 says, yea, my reins shall rejoice when your lips speak right things. Say not the wrong thing. Say the right thing. It goes a long way. A bad thing goes a long way. A wrong thing goes a wrong way. And also a long way, I'm sorry, and uh, a right thing also will go a long way. People don't want to speak the right thing. People want to say what is most choicey, 
what is most acceptable in the society. It kills me to death. It tickles me to death. I feel miserable. It's hectic. I'm tired over and over again. And no wonder when you fall sick, you, you have given bullets to the enemy to shoot you down. And when you're feeling weary, you say, didn't I say that I'm getting weary? Age is catching up. I'm not strong enough. Somebody can be also healthy even doing all the exercises right, but if his words are not good, God says, I don't take any pleasure. Yea, my reins, my innermost being shall rejoice when your lips speak right things. The lips is a place where you release. And there can be thoughts that can come up to your tongue and you might say, oh, I, should I say it or not? Don't open your mouth. Zip your, zip your lips. Say, if you don't want to say it, you can, you can hold it back and say, oh, oh right, okay. I'm, I'm, I take those words back. I don't want to speak those. I'm going to speak everything that is good. I'm going to speak the right thing right thing in Isaiah chapter 50 and verse number 4 God says I wake you up Isaiah 50 and verse 4 50 and it says the Lord hath given me the tongue of the learned I may not be a learned man but I still have the tongue of the learned I thank God for that he gives, you know, we need to believe these words because these are life-giving words that will keep you strong and healthy and spiritual and in times of trouble, you can handle your situation. The Lord has given me the tongue of the learned. The Lord has given me the tongue of the learned. I got a tongue, just like a learned man can speak that I should know how to speak a word in season to them, that it, them uh, to him that is weary. And the first person is you, yourself, I, my, myself. That I should know how to speak a word in the season that I'm living in. Maybe if I'm weary today, I don't have to say what I'm, what I'm going through, I can say what I desire. What you desire is different to what you already have. God spoke to a preacher and told him, if I can get my people to speak what they want, I can bring to pass in their life, but they are only speaking what they have. If you speak what you have, then you're not going to take off the ground. You've got to speak what you desire. And the Bible very clearly says you are a righteous man and God gives you good desires, not evil desires. And you would know you have a strong conscience by the Holy Spirit himself that you're not going to ask for the wrong thing. Every child of God has a strong conscience within them. That's why they are able to discern things. That's why they are able to say no to a lot of things. Likewise, when you have a strong conscience, you are speaking or you're asking according to your conscience. The, uh, and the, the, the proverb it says, the desire of the righteous is good always. The re desire of the righteous is good. You're a righteous man. People love to call themselves sinners, unworthy, a piece of dust, a nobody. But God wants you to call yourself the righteousness of God. He made you right in the presence of God. You are righteous. We are righteous in his sight, not because we have done good things, because of what he did for us on the cross. And he has brought us, elevated us to a platform by saying, you are the righteousness of God now. You are the righteousness of God. So if you're righteous, then your, your desires are going to be good. Your desires are going to be good. Proverbs, I believe it's in, uh, oh, let's turn to that maybe, and then come back to the other scripture again. The desire of the righteous, it's 
23. The desire of the righteous is only good. Trust your desires. I mean, when you have a good desire, trust your desire. Don't say, oh, I think, oh, that has come from the flesh, that has come from the devil, or that's because somebody else has it, and maybe I want it. But the Bible says you're the righteousness of God, you're the righteous man, and your desires are always good. Good. You don't want to even ask because it's too big sometimes. We kind of think, God, it's too big for me to desire. There's some good things you can ask from the Lord because the desire of the righteous is only good. Let us be faith people. Surrounding ourselves with faith instead of surrounding ourselves with the, with the, with the unbelief that is in the world and the fears that is in the world. People kind of think that we all have to be I mean, all got to be bogged down to the world and we are supposed to be under the world. But God didn't say that. He said, you are a, you're a righteous man and your desires are only good. And Jesus said in, in Mark chapter 11 and verse uh, 24, whatsoever things you desire, right? Let's go to that scripture. And Mark 11 and verse 24, therefore I say unto you, whatsoever, what things soever you desire, now understanding that you're a righteous man and your desire is only good, whatsoever things you desire, many people, they go down to the grave with all their desires along with their desires because for many years, they have never opened their mouths and requested the Lord. They've never, never moved towards what they desire. And they will say, oh my God, I missed a lot when I was here on earth. I would have done much more for Christ. You know, God made, made us to be doing his will. So he puts good desires into our hearts. And remember, when you're a righteous man, God puts good desires into your heart. Therefore, I said to you, whatsoever things you desire. He didn't say whatsoever thing God desire because God puts his desires into your heart. What things soever you desire when you pray, when you bring your request before the Lord, believe that you receive them. Believe. Believing comes before receiving them. But we wait for the receiving part first and then we believe. But that's not the way that's putting the cart before the horse. It takes you to the wrong destiny. Believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Believe that you receive them and you shall have them. So you shall have them comes after you believe. You shall receive after you believe. So the believing part of it is the most important part. Now, if I believe, I'm not going to get stuck with my belief inside of my heart. Oh, I have a lot of desire, but I don't want to say it out. I don't want to declare it because I'm afraid if the devil hears it, maybe he'll, he'll tamper with my prayer. Well, that's what you really want to do. Let him hear what he wants to. If you're truly a believer you also have a saying part of it. If that beggar who was seated by the roadside with his old tattered garments and said, if Jesus really is a man of God and a prophet of God and if he is sent of God, he should know my desire. He should know that I I, I, I'm blind here and I like to get healed. But that was not so. In the, in the crowds, in the midst of thousands of people, I suppose, or maybe hundreds, let us say, hundreds of people walking down the street, this blind man, he just heard all this commotion and he said, what's happening? Who is going by? 
And they said, Jesus of Nazareth is going by. He said, I know who Jesus of Nazareth is. And his declaration was not Jesus of Nazareth. His declaration was, Thou, son of David, have mercy on me. He didn't, he didn't, want, to be, he didn't want to say what everybody said. They all thought he is the, the son, he is the son of Joseph. He is uh, a carpenter's son. They wanted to believe him. That's all they believed, and they just walked by. They just passed him. Maybe we should go to that scripture. Let's read uh, Luke chapter eighteen and the latter part of it. Luke chapter eighteen. See, we got to believe and we got to build ourselves by hearing faith messages. And when you start hearing messages of faith, you start believing. And when you start believing, you can't keep yourself shut. You have to open your mouth wide and speak. Yeah, I believe if God wants, he can let me have it. No, God wants you to declare it. Say it out. Verse 35 onwards, Luke chapter 18 and verse 35 onwards, and it came to pass that as he was come nigh, to Jeri nigh unto Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. He sat by the wayside begging because that was his profession. He wore that beggar's garment and he just begged. He didn't, but when it came to Jesus, he didn't beg. He didn't beg. Like, just like people say, oh yeah, God met his need because he was begging. No, he, God didn't. Jesus passed him by while he was begging. Jesus passed him by and people think, oh, it's so humble for us to beg from God. Oh, please, Lord, give me, Lord. I need, Lord. I'm just really going through this. Oh, God, please, Lord. And people think the more they beg, they get from God. But that's not the way God gives us. That's not the way he gives us. And the next verse says, And hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. He asked what it meant. What's all this commotion that is going around? And the next verse, And they told him, Jesus of Nazareth passeth, by. Now when you think of Jesus of Nazareth, you would always think of a carpenter. You will think of a carpenter's son he is. You would think he is the son of Joseph. And he, he is somebody who is, uh, we know his brothers and sisters. That's, what, that's how people recognized him. They said Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Probably They, they probably would have been saying this. But when you come, now this was the reply that he got from the people. But see the next verse. It really, it really changed me when I heard. He should have cried out, Jesus of Nazareth. Why didn't he? He didn't cry out, Jesus of Nazareth. He cried or made a strong declaration by saying, Jesus, you are the son of David. You are the son of David. I know the sure mercies of David is clearly mentioned in the book of Psalm 103 and verse number 1, 2, and 3. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Forget not all. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Forget not all all his benefits. And benefit number one in verse number three, it says, who forgives, forgives all our iniquities. All our iniquities, which includes every generational curse. If I'm blind today because of a generational curse, Lord, I believe in the son of David who said, who forgives all my iniquities. All my iniquities. There is no reason that I have to stay in this condition. 
who forgives all my iniquities and who heals all my diseases. So today I come, Lord, before you and I'm calling you out. Let's go back to the same scripture again in the book of Luke chapter uh, 18. Luke chapter 18 and verse 38. And he cried saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Let your grace be manifested in my life. Son of David, you promised. You promised the sure mercies of David to be fulfilled in my life. Let me show you another scripture from the book of Isaiah 55. He says, come unto him, all you that thirst. And then he says, Isaiah 55, in verse number three, incline your ear and come unto me, says the Lord. Incline your ear and come unto me, hear, and your soul shall live. By hearing the word of God, you will live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Now this blind man would have been carried to the synagogue and he would have heard these sermons of the sure mercies of David. He would have heard the message of the sure mercies of David. And faith had already built in his heart and I, and he waited and he waited for the mercies of David. And the mercies of David is the son of, uh, son of God to be manifested through the lineage of David. And that's Jesus. And this blind man had a revelation while all the others just had some information. So you can live by information because that can be so instilled into you. Some information that you have heard in the past can be so instilled into you that when a revelation comes, you don't want to receive the revelation, but you want to stay in the information that you have. God wants you to change. Going back again to the book of Luke 18 and verse 30, 38, he cried saying, Jesus, he had a revelation within him. He didn't agree with the information that they had. You can be informed that it's God's will that, that you should be sick in your body. If you go to a traditional church, I'm very sorry to say that because that's how it is. Because most of the people, they say, well, it's not God's will. But they don't minister faith. They minister unbelief. Oh, everybody has to fall sick or else how will they die? And that's not the preaching of Christ. That's not the preaching of the cross. That's preaching of the, of the five senses. We all know that flesh and blood does not inherit the kingdom of God. We know that somewhere down the line that we will conquer the last enemy, which is physical death. But there is no argument at all about that. But we're talking about divine healing. We're talking about how one can be healed and how one can be living in divine health and enjoy the goodness of God. He cried out. Now, he was informed. The earlier verse, verse 37, he was informed that Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. That was the information that everybody commonly believed in. Jesus of Nazareth. What can Jesus of Nazareth do? The only thing he could do is he could just do some carpentry and fix something for us Anything to do with wood, we'll contact him, Jesus of Nazareth. But this man had a revelation. He didn't pronounce the information. He had a revelation. This whom they call Jesus of Nazareth, he is the son of David. And I'm calling upon the son of David now. I'm calling for, not for some carpentry work, but I'm calling for some eye-fixing work. I'm talking about fixing my eyeballs. I'm talking about something that can happen to me supernaturally. I'm talking about not something that will happen in the natural realm. Anybody can do. I can get a carpenter if I have, a, if I have some woodwork, but I don't want him to come. I want somebody to fix my eyes. I've got to call upon 
the son of God. He is the son of David. He is the son of David. Have mercy on me. When you're calling for mercy, you're calling for, I mean, you're calling for everything that mercy has provided for you through the blood of Jesus Christ. And the next verse says, verse 39, and David went before him, they, and David went before him, rebuked him. Do you know something? When you speak out the revelation that you have, you will have people who would rebuke you because you don't speak their information. You speak revelation. You get rebuked for speaking revelation. But if you speak the same language they speak, if you speak the information that they have, you're welcome, brother. You're welcome. You're always welcome. But you, you be an outstanding person when you speak by revelation. You're speaking a revelation. You're speaking something beyond human understanding. You're speaking something beyond the information, that, the common information that people have. Oh yeah, we know who Jesus is. But do you know that he is the son of God? Yes, we believe that he is the son of God. Yeah, but do you believe that Jesus can come into your heart and live inside of Oh yeah, that will take ages for me to, oh, I'm just a sinner. I'm just, he, doesn't, he just has some information. He needs a revelation that Christ can come into his heart. And that's how people get saved. People get saved by revelation, not by information, just alone. A lot of people are informed about Jesus. Well, you've got to start with some information. You've got to tell them. But without the revelation, you can never be saved. And they which went before him rebuked him. You can ask yourself, how many times have you been rebuked for standing your ground by speaking out the promises of God? Because religious hypocrites will always stand against a revelation that you have. And they might tell you, who do you think you are? Do you know more than the preacher? Do you think you know more than me? I wouldn't be surprised. Jesus, he said, out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, you have ordained praise to shut the mouth of the enemies. That's how God does things. That's how God does things. He can get the babes to shout out the blessing and stop the works of Satan in the lives of people. And they which went before him rebuked him. You get rebuked if you start saying, I believe that God is my shield and my protection. That God is my ultimate source of supply. I know I'm working. I know that there is a pathway that I get my wages, but I believe for great rewards in my life. And they think, my, you do, who do you think you are? You think you're a millennial's child, the way, the way you talk? You can say, much more. I'm talking about the one to whom the cattle in the thousand hills belong to. I'm talking about the one whom the mountains belong to. I'm talking about the one who says the silver is mine and the gold is mine. Or they will say, he's a nut, we'll just take him off. He should not be around us because he's too proud to be around us. We are so humble. And we are so unworthy in the sight of God. We are dust. We're just nobodies. We are nothing. And how, do, how could I say that my father owns the cattle in the thousand hills? The Bible says so. Let's turn to the book of Psalms. 50. Psalms 50. That's the attitude that you should have when you bring your tithes and your offerings before the Lord. Psalm 50 and verse number 7. Psalm 50 and verse number 7. Hear me, O my people, I will speak, O Israel. Now he's speaking to us as much as he spoke to Israel. And I will testify against thee. I'm God. I'm testifying against your unbelief and your fears and your doubts. I'm God. Even your God. 
I'm not just God only, but I'm your God. It tells me that I'm in covenant with you, that I need to, I, I, I am bound to meet your needs. Which means I got to believe to see how God works in my life. And the next verse, I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices or thy burnt offerings that you have continually, that have been continually before me. In other words, I would not rebuke you for the sacrifices and the burnt offerings or the offerings and the tithes that you have brought before me. I'm not going to reprove you or rebuke you for that. I'm not going to rebuke, rebuke you for that which you have continually brought before me. I'm not going to rebuke you. I accept it. And the next verse, I will take no bullock out of your house, nor he goats out of your folds. I'm not taking anything from you by you bringing your sacrifices to me. I'm not taking, you know, we always think God takes it from me. God took away my one-tenth. God took away my offering. God, he said, I don't want anything. If you're giving it in that attitude, I don't want you to even bring it to me. I will not take a bullock out of your house, nor a he-goat out of thy foals. The next verse. For every beast in the forest is mine. He said, everything belongs to me anyway. Everything belongs to every beast of the field of the forest is mine and the cattle upon a thousand hills is mine. Well, if he, if he owns the cattle, surely he owns the lands too, which includes everything. He, he not rented out anything from any man. Everything belongs to him. He, he, he uses the mountains, the hills for his cattle to be fed. He says, that's who I am. Every beast of the forest and the cattle upon thousand hills, they're mine. The next verse. I know all the fowls of the mountains and the fields and, 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 the, and the wild beasts of the fields are mine. He says, I'm the possessor. I possess everything. And what does it mean when he says, I want you to believe when you give, that you're bringing it to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the great Jehovah, Chire, the Almighty God, who is willing to, he, he says, ah, it's, it's your attitude that I see when you bring. The next verse, if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell thee. He's not taking anything for himself. For the world is mine and the fullness there. He says, this is all what belongs to me. Everything belongs to me anyway. Everything belongs to me. So why would you want to hold it and say, oh, it's mine? See, it all has to do with this attitude that we bring before the Lord because God is willing to honor us and, and bring us into a place where we have over and above that we would have enough and more to give to every good work. That's what he wants us to understand when we bring our tithes and our offerings. It all has to do with our attitude. The next verse Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? God is not bloodthirsty. He's not going to eat any flesh. The next verse. Offer unto me, offer unto God thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Come before him with thanksgiving. Lord, I thank you for, the, for this opportunity that you have given me that I can bring my offerings and tithes unto you and I will pay my vows unto the most high I will bring my vows I come before you with my offering it's an attitude that you come with the first death that we see in the old covenant or in the, in the very origin in the very beginning where Cain had a problem about his attitude and he killed his brother. And in the, in the New Testament, we also see Sephariah and Ananias having a problem with their attitude, and they got killed because they believed the lie. Sad 
to see they, when they bring their offerings and they come with an attitude in their hearts. So oh, they take all my money away and God is, God is taking away my money and why can't, he, why can't he do something else? Why can't he rain down some money? He has rained down everything that belongs, that needs to be rained down into our lives, but he wants an attitude from us. And Sephirah and Ananias, they both heard the voice of the devil and they lied to the Holy Spirit. Maybe quickly we can put that scripture up and come back to the scripture in uh, uh, Acts 6, I believe. Acts 6 or 5. The first few verses. Acts 5. But Ananias, but a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a position. And when they sold the position, they decided what they're going to do with it. And they said it. They made a vow to the Lord. And the next verse says, and kept back a part of the price. His wife also being privately to it. They got together and said, okay, the preacher, we don't want to make the preacher too rich. And we want to keep him too humble. We don't want to give what we decided to give. So we are going to keep some and then give. And then maybe we would decide later. And they heard the voice of the devil and they brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. And the next verse says, And Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? They were not lying to Peter. They were lying to the Holy Spirit. It was a problem with their attitude. It was a problem that they had with their attitude and kept back part of the prize. And the next verse we find that he and the judgment came upon him. While it would remain, was it not thine own? When it was theirs, it belonged to them. But when they said, now we decide to sell this property and go and use it for the right cause and we're going to give it. Because at that time, we found that people were, were doing this uh, uh, with, a, with, with a good attitude in their heart and they were joyfully bringing their, bring their, their, their belongings for the preaching of the gospel and the work of the gospel. And after it was sold, was it not that, that was, uh, and after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? When you sold the property, it never belonged to you anymore because you had already spoken with your words that we sell this property at a certain value and then everything goes to God. Why has, have you conceived this thing in your heart? They conceived a lie of the devil and the devil came and told them, oh, don't you give all this money to the gospel work or oh, you might need some time or maybe you can give him little by little so what you decide in your heart and God has spoken to you and, and, and the Bible talks about uh, you deciding and going before the Lord and making a vow and saying, Lord, I, I, I want to bring this and I want to give it to you because I know by giving it to you, I'll, I'll never lose anything out. There are many people walking like dead corpse because they have vowed many vows to God. Lord, I'll do this. If you do this for me, I'll do this for you, Lord. And God, and God sees that they have been, they've been lied by the devil and they never do what they said. And thou hast lied not unto men but unto God. They lied to God. And the next verse, what happened? And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down. He heard the words and he fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear came upon them. And today we can see many people walking like dead corpse. You might say, we don't see this type of thing happening in the New Testament church. Maybe we might see in the near future. But there are many people who have made several vows, but they don't keep. God, I'll do this for you, Lord. I'll do this for you. I'm sure, Lord. I will make sure that I'll do this. It's better you say not. Because once you say it, and if you don't repent and say, Lord, please forgive me, the, or else the enemy would come and steal the blessing out of you and you're going to walk as a dead corp all the days of your life. 
So it's a good thing for us to watch our words and speak the right things. So going back again to the book of Luke, chapter 18 and verse number 40, I believe. And Jesus stood. Okay, we'll go to verse 39. And when they went when they uh, re- uh, and they which went before him rebuked him. You get rebuked for the right words that you speak. That he should not, that he should hold his peace. How many times have you heard the word that has really made you free, set you free? And you said, I'm going to get on to this word and I'm going to live with this word. I'm going to say this word. I'm going to declare these promises. I'm going to not only say this, but I'm going, to, I'm going to even educate this to other people also. I'm going to bring this knowledge to other people also. I'm not going to stop. I'm going to have that fire in me and I'm going to talk to people. But when you got rebuked by one person, some religious character came by your way and told you something and you say, oh, I'm going to hold my peace from today onwards. I'm no longer going to say anything more. Because they kind of think that I belong to this bunch and that bunch and you've you got to be careful about this bunch and you've got to be careful about that bunch. You know, they overdo things. There's nothing to overdo here. He's, this is the activation of this blind man's faith to receive from God. And when they rebuked him that he should hold his peace, he didn't, like most of us do, like most of us, we kind of, you know, think, well, why should I get into problems? I, after all, I need friends. I need my good relatives. I need people, a good neighborhood. And I wouldn't want to be, I, I wouldn't want to make uh, them displeased at the cost of you living a joyful life. You want to stop because they don't like it. You know, Jesus said, I come to you as a sword. In the family, you will have five and two for me and three against me. And don't you think that I come and bring peace into your life? I come as a sword. Jesus said, I didn't say, Jesus said. So when the sword comes, there may be times that you have to make your decision and say, I'm going to walk this walk. Not a religious walk. I'm going to believe. I'm not going to hold my peace. Just because somebody in the house doesn't like it. I'll keep my peace with them. But I'm not going to hold my peace. I'm going to declare. I'm going to say what I believe. How many children of God have been duped into believing something that is not scriptural because of the rebuke that they've had from people. Maybe God has a calling in your life. That you should be doing something, but you want to do it on the sly. I don't want to, I mean, I don't want to get in too deep into it. But this man was bold. He walked boldly and he cried out so much the more. I mean, if you started saying that I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus and somebody didn't like it, you're going to howl and you're going to, you're going to leap for joy and say, I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. You're not going to stop just because somebody doesn't like it. I had many people who tried to put that blanket covering over me and say, oh, don't get into an extreme. There's nothing. God is in one extreme and the devil is on the other extreme. Anything in between is lukewarmness. And Christ says, I hate lukewarmness. I will spew you out. Read the book of Revelations 3 and verse 15. I'll spew you out if you're lukewarm. God is in one extreme and the devil is on the other extreme. There's nothing for us to put together and say, well, okay, we got the scripture there. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spew you out of my mouth. Right? God doesn't want us to be lukewarm. He wants us to be hot or cold. Lukewarm is very, very dangerous. 
So many people who kind of live this lukewarmness, and then God says, I say, yuck to it. I don't like lukewarmness. You better be hot for me. You better be hot for me. So this blind man is a wonderful example for every one of us who believe in declarations, who believe in revelations, not just to have some information because information is all right for natural things and even for spiritual things. Maybe probably an information might help you to step into a revelation, but don't stay in the little information. You got every information must be checked out with the word of God. Any preacher who speaks, let's go to the word, check with the word. Go to the New Testament, don't just take an Old Testament scripture and pull it out and say, here, what Job said it. So that's in the scripture. Job said, God giveth and God taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So we people take that scripture out, and, out of context and say, there, see, Job said it. Well, Job said it, through his pressure, but if you read the whole story, the devil was behind the scene. The devil put pressure on him and he said, God gives and God takes away. He didn't have, he had no revelation at all about the devil taking things away from him. Until nine months later, he realized that my, my judgments and my discernments were wrong and I'm going to put my hand in my mouth and I'm going to say, God, you are everything, you know everything. And God blessed him twice as much as he had. Everything was restored back to him when he repented. Going back again to the book of Luke chapter 18. 18, Luke chapter 18. And, there, and they that went before him rebuked him. Have you been rebuked because you're spiritually strong? Either jealousy or ignorance, they rebuke you. Because when you start walking in the blessing of God, when you, when you see that your confession brings your possession, when you start confessing, and when you start acting differently, you're talking differently, you're moving differently, they will say, hold your peace. But you've got to say, I'm going to do it more. Just like they tried to do it with David. David, he found that the only way is the old method that we need to use to bring the ark back to Jerusalem is to use not any modern new method of worship and praise and bringing in the presence of the Lord. They used, originally they probably would have told David maybe we will use a new cart. And they used a new cart, put the ark on the new cart and they brought the covenant. Uh, the, 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 uh, they, they tried to, uh, the ark of the covenant. And then we find that Uzziah, the man who touched the cart, was trying to slip off, and Uzziah touched the cart, and then he died. And David was displeased, and he said, I'm going to go back to the old method. I'm going to get the Levites to, to carry the ark on their shoulders, and we're going to make a joyful noise. They're going to make a joyful noise. And they made a joyful noise, and, and, and probably he was dancing away and bringing in the Ark of the Covenant. And we find that David's wife, Michal, she was watching. And when, he came, when David came back to meet Michal with some gifts, she despised him and said, Oh, I saw the king today like a vain person, like one of these loafers on the road, dancing away naked. They're supposed to be a king. He said, I'll do much more for God. I'll do more for God. I suppose we should read that scripture. Uh, it's in Samuel. If I'm not mistaken, Second Samuel. I'll do even more if I have to. Because God, the presence of the Lord means everything to me. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, maybe you can go home and read all the scriptures. It's good for you to know in verse 3 we see they found a new method of bringing the presence of the Lord by using a new cart. Today we find lots of churches using new methods 
to bring down the presence of the Lord. The kind of thing, you know, we, we need to get the youngsters, you know, get involved with this, get involved with that. And, you know, they try to do all kinds of things, but they still fail to bring the presence of the Lord. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out. But it didn't work. It didn't work. So they went back to the old method. And verse number, f- verse number, you can read all that there, we're not going to go into all that. But then verse 14 we find, uh, and David danced before the Lord with all his might. And the verses before that, they found that uh, Obadidim got so blessed and David said, I want to be brought to Jerusalem that all the people might be blessed, not just one person. So they brought, and David brought the Ark of the Covenant, danced before the Lord with all his might, and David girded himself with the linen and the ephod. So David and all the household of Israel brought the Ark of the Lord with shoutings, with the sound of trumpets. And verse 16, as the ark of the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through the window. Some people, they look through the window and see the kind of way that you make your spiritual worship and thanksgiving and declarations and they want to Make fun of you. She looked through the window and saw the king leaping and dancing before the Lord and she despised him. Somebody very near to you and so close to you can despise your spiritual walk with the Lord. But don't you get fooled or don't you be threatened or don't you feel Uh, intimidated because your walk is between you and the Lord. Many people have become so unspiritual in their lives and they kind of think, well, if I, I like to please God, but after all, what about the people? Who cares about your nearest and your dearest? It's not that you don't care for them, but when it comes to you and the Lord, you've got to make sure that you're going to obey the Lord in all what you think is right. Do all with your might. And the ark came into the city and, and Saul's daughter looked through the window. There are many people who are looking at you and they despise. And when she came, she despised. Verse number 23, verse number 22, and I will be more wild. Verse 22, verse 21, let's read verse 21 first. And David came to Michal and it was before the Lord. Uh, before the Lord which chose me before thy father, before all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore will I play before the Lord. It's all before the Lord that I do. She despised, verse 20 actually she despised, and Jesus, and David said, I will do. And I'll be more wild, verse 22, than thus, and be based in my own sight. It's not me. It's God in me. Everything that matters is God. I'll be more. And the maid servants which thou hast spoken of, and of them shall I be, uh, I be had in honor. In other words, he said, I'm going to be even worse, just like this man. He said, my spiritual walk with the Lord is never going to be and there's not going to be any hindrance coming by trying to stop me from serving him, loving him, speaking his words. And my commitment will never be uh, a kind of commitment that I'll just be intimidated by the people around me. I'll tell you one thing. If you really want to do it all, all your heart and soul and mind, you better be, you better be before the Lord it's you be, and, the, and the Lord, not people around you. It's going to be you and the Lord, right? So we're going to just uh, close from there and it's time because and uh, 
But I want, to exp- I want to really come to one more scripture and close because do all things with all your might and strength in the presence of the Lord and don't you be intimidated by anybody. Well, I think we should close with uh, uh, Luke 18 and I just want to read one more scripture from John before we close. Luke 18, we'll close the story there. And verse number 39, and they which went before him rebuked him that he should hold his peace, but he cried much more, much the more. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. He shouted and he cried out his covenant, what belongs to him. And let the devil know, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to speak out what belongs to me. It's mine. I will inherit my my uh, promises, I'm not going to be carried away or let the devil just trap me into believing and doing something else. And Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought before, uh, brought unto him, and when he was come, Jesus stood. I like that scripture. Jesus stood. He couldn't move because of the words that were spoken by this blind beggar. He said, I couldn't move. It was like, God speaks to me through visions and when I read the Bible I sometimes see, he said, I was pasted. I couldn't move because this man's shoutings pulled me and I had to stand until I do what he wanted. I see, when I read the scripture, I, I sometimes see them in picture form. And Jesus stood. He said, I cannot even go. I can't move forward because this man's spiritual commitment and this man's commitment towards the covenant is so strong that I cannot move. I cannot displease my father. I have to answer him because he's calling out in faith. And that's how it's going to be. When you speak God's word, don't let any man or woman stop you. Speak the word and never be intimidated. And God heard his prayer and he spoke to him. I'm going to close with this scripture that was really so much of a blessing to me to understand. John chapter 12. And I'm going to close with that. I'm sure going to close with John chapter 12 and verse number 42. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers. Now here we find among the chief rulers also many believed on him. Many believed on him. You find a lot of many, you find many believers around you. They believe. But because of the Pharisees, the pretenders, the hypocrites, the strong, intimidating people, they did not confess him. Your believing has to always go with your confession. Because of the Pharisees, they did not. You might have the generation of Phariseeism that's coming down from generation to generation. Even today, we have Pharisees. They would say, don't do it so hard. Don't get yourself so involved because you're getting involved with something that is not scriptural and they would try to stop you. They would say, yeah, you can be a believer, but don't say what you believe. Don't say what you believe. Yeah, yeah, you believe, yeah, you believe in healing, you believe in all that, you keep in church. Go to church, stay there and do everything in church and when you come back, just be friends with us and talk our language, talk the way we talk and just get around with us and be hypocrites as we are. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him lest they should be put out of the synagogue. You'll be excommunicated. You'll be, you'll be put out of their company. Oh, my precious friends, but they are Pharisees. They are practicing Phariseeism. Hypocrites. Why would you want to even have a friend of that nature? Why would you want to even have a Pharisee around you? You might meet some of them and your conscience will tell you this guy is a Pharisee. But still you say, after all, I mean, he's an influential guy. I mean, I, after all, I mean, I mean, he can really tar my image and tarnish my image. 
and I wouldn't want, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll be okay with him. I would not say what I want to say because in his presence I got to be quiet. But the blind beggar did not. David did not. They did it all the more. Lest they be put out of the synagogue. You'll be put out of company if you're a believer and if you're a confessor. If, if you're a believer, it's okay because you're believing in your heart, but you've got to confess with your mouth. You've got to confess with your mouth. And the next verse brings us to the closing factor. For they love the praises of men, or they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. How many Christians are compromising? How many of them are compromising? They say, we believe, but we don't want to say it. Because if we say it, we hurt some people. So we want the praise of people. At the risk of my not living a life of faith and letting my healing go by me, I want to please people more than pleasing God. I want to be honored by people than God honoring me. When God honors you, you have a testimony. When God honors you, when you go through a trial, you come out of the trial by confessing and standing firm with what you believe in. You overcome and you have a testimony and you can go and testify it. You can talk to people about how God healed you. Don't you get carried away. It's a very, it doesn't look a very strong message, but to me it's a very strong message. I got to be more wild than I was. I want to be more, I, I mean, people try to stop me, but I'm still going to be more. Why would I want to live among, why would I want to fear a woman who looks by the window and looks at me and despises me for my praising and worshipping the Lord? And I, why would I want the crowds who rebuke me for my faith? Do I want to be a lover of people or do I want to be a lover of God? Heavenly Father, you brought us to your position to make our commitments right, our attitudes right. Lord, it's not just believing in our heart but making a declaration with our mouth makes the difference. We activate or we, we put wheels to our faith to get the job done. That we might be the lighthouse wherever we go. Our declarations bring healing to the nations. Our preachings, not what we hide in our heart and say, yeah, I'm a believer, but. You see, I'm a believer, but you see. But Lord, we thank you that you have I take authority over the spirit of compromise and I rebuke it. And I pray that we would be strong, bold in our confession. Thank you, Father, for teaching us the truth. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's partake in the covenant meal.
Father, we bless your glorious name. We thank you, Father, for the goodness of God. We thank you for the covenant that you made with us. Lord, this is not just a ritual or some religious practice, but you said do it in remembrance of me. So, Lord, you said it, and we do it according to your word. And, Lord, we thank you for the covenant that you made with us on the cross. You died for us that we might have life. You went through all the agony and the pain that we might have peace and joy. And Father, we pray that let this covenant be fulfilled in each and every one of our lives as we walk this walk of faith that you are with us and you never leave us nor forsake us. Your covenant says so in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's part it together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the covenant. I pray healing into the lives of people. I speak joy into the lives of people. I speak bondages be broken in the name of Jesus. I pray in Jesus' name that there'll be boldness arising in the lives of people. That they would desire even as the good and, and the righteous man desires good things. I pray, Lord, for each and every person as they honor you, Lord, this day with their tithes and their offerings, that you would bless them, Father, according to as they purpose in their hearts, as you have led them by the Holy Spirit, as it is written according to the scriptures, that they would come before you and worship you and honor you with their tithes and their offerings. In Jesus' name, let's honor him. Thank you, Lord. There is power. Break it. 
Jesus, so much power. There is power in the name of Jesus. Oh, so much. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. To break every chain, break every chain. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for this beautiful time that you gave us, Lord. We strengthen ourselves in the Spirit of God. We strengthen ourselves by the Word of God. We strengthen ourselves, O oh God, by all the declarations that we made. And we strengthen ourselves by the songs, of oh God. And we thank you, Lord, even as we honor you with our tithes and our offerings. And you said, bring all your tithes into the storehouse, O oh God that there might be meat in my house. Father, Lord, you minister to us with your meat today, O oh God. I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name that you have delivered us, Father, and, and uh, destroyed the works of darkness out of our lives. And Father, moreover, we believe that you have made us a lighthouse to wherever we go and whomever we meet, O oh Father. Words that we utter are going to make people free, Lord. Our people are going to understand that there is life in the powerful words that you have put within our hearts, O oh God. And Lord, I pray for every believer in this place, O oh God, that they would declare what they believe. They would speak what they believe. I pray, Lord, that they would not be silent believers. There is nothing called a secret believer, but they are going to believe. I thank you for your grace, your love. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for keeping each and every one of us strong and healthy. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.